we review seven principles of civil discourse every time we talk, but especially when we have a bishop in the room, we want to practice. <laughs> Although you're used to if practice. only I could take those around with me. Uh, <laughs> um, and it was, it was uh, interesting. We had a, a person here uh, in the first session, and we finished re reviewing the rules of seven uh, principles of discourse. She said, I didn't see those practice a lot on TV this week. <laughs> Which I think was quite insightful. Uh, uh, but we review these because we acknowledge we're not very good at civil discourse. We want people to engage in conversations, but it's great uh, to have some rules on the road. So here they are. Now, for those of you who are new here, the people here in this room who come here, they know these all by heart. And if you were to ask them, they would tell you all seven by heart. <laughs> or they'd make up something. It's very good to create a group. Uh, so they are, we want to respect one another. We want to listen deeply to someone else. We want to speak for ourselves and not that we're like all Lutherans or all men or all men or, or all Democrats or Republicans. We speak for ourselves. We understand other viewpoints because people will say things and you go, wow, where did they come up with that one? Well, there's usually a deep experience behind any viewpoints that you have, and so we want to hear what, what has shaped and formed them down at the viewpoint. We are grateful when people speak up. It's not easy in a large room, with, and we don't know everyone, and then to speak up and give your opinion, not easy. So we're grateful when people uh, share. Uh, we practice forgiveness. And the Eighth Commandment. By the way, the Eighth Commandment means you put the best construction. That's the one we usually break uh, on cable uh, TV, right? You say, oh, someone is this from this tribe, so they must, you know, be evil, right? So we want to put the best construction, and the one we always forgot, the eighth one, is do not kill. So that, I think we are fine. Uh, it's a real pleasure. As you know, we've been talking about faith, work, and economics, faith vocation economics here for several years. Um, and when I moved from Philadelphia back to Chicago, uh, Wayne, Mich uh, Wayne Miller was my bishop. And when we got together, we did talk about issues in the ELCA. We did, we did do that. Occasionally, yeah. Occasionally. <laughs> it's good to complain with someone who actually yeah. knows what's going on. Uh, but this is what we got into. We talked about the issues of faith, work, and economics. And one of the things that uh, uh, Wayne Miller brings to the conversation, he was in business. I called him a businessman before. He took umbrage <laughs> at that, but he was in business for many years before getting into um, the church as far as a pastoring and then as a bishop. And so I, I like that he brings all those sensitivities to the subject matter. And so again, this is just for today, but tomorrow we'll get the full presentation at 10 o'clock. And with that, welcome. Thank you. Bishop Miller. Thank you. By the way, we have people here from Chicago. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I, I love coming to Emmanuel. This is not my first time here. I was telling people this morning I love to come to Emmanuel because I see all my friends from up north. <laughs> A lot of folks from our area. But it is great to be here, uh, especially today. And even though we have a uh, somewhat brief time to go into a very um, interesting and complex subject, um, I think that it's helpful in this case for me to give a little bit of autobiography because uh, it, it connects in some important ways with the subject matter. I uh, retired in September at the end of my second six-year term as Bishop of the Metropolitan Chicago Synod at the ELCA. Um, that in and of itself is somewhat unusual. I, I actually am the first person to do two full six-year terms as Bishop mm -hmm. in Chicago. It's not a longevity kind of position, um, but uh, was uh, a great privilege really to do that ministry. Prior to that, for 13 years, I was senior pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran in Aurora, Illinois, um, which was a wonderful parish experience, rapidly growing congregation. Uh, we uh, doubled the size of the congregation while I was there and all the attendant challenges that go with that. Prior to that, I spent eight years on the staff at Our Savior's Lutheran in Naperville, in Illinois. Uh, my first call was a split call. I was half-time at a church in the city on the north side, half-time chaplain at a residential center for severely disabled children. 
Um, and ministry was not my first career, as Rick indicated. Um, before that, and I'll kind of work the other direction now for this part of it. I uh, graduated from Augustana College in Rock Island with a music education degree and taught junior and senior high school music in a small town in Iowa for several years. Wasn't sure that that felt like it was going to be career, and so I came back to Chicago, which was home, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I just kind of kicked around the team for a job. The first thing I landed was uh, a job working in tech support in the engineering department of the Pettibone Corporation, which made uh, everything from railroad rails and switches to forklift trucks and logging equipment. It was a magnificent industrial <coughs> education for me, really. I worked, in, I worked first in tech support for the engineering people, but then moved into purchasing. I bought hydraulic hose and fittings, spare parts, uh, fasteners, a bunch of things in, in my uh, role in buying, and then took a position with National Can Corporation in uh, buying uh, tooling and manufacturing equipment. And then the, this is kind of the odd turn in all of this. Uh, they actually offered me a position in manufacturing engineering because they were looking for someone with some negotiating skill to interface with, with suppliers from the engineering department. So they taught me how to design tools to make beer cans. Um, great. For you, a beer can is just a beer can. For me, it's a piece of jewelry. <laughs> Amazing thing. And during that time um, was uh, also on the evenings and weekends singing professionally with Chicago Symphony Chorus, so I got a chance to use my music a little bit then. And that's when I sort of got the itch to go back to seminary. I'm married to 40 years now to my wife, Pam, and uh, we have two grown sons. Um, Anyway, I share all of that uh, partly just so you have a chance to get to know who I am, but partly because even though I am shy about actually calling myself a businessman because of where I was in my career when I was working in business, but it was a, but it was a wonderful experience for me. And, and if the seminary itch hadn't come, I, I would have been very happy um, making a career in life in business. And during that time that was my first real awareness of this question of how is it that I connect my life in the business community to my faith life. How do those two things fit together? And so this has become a sort of a recurring theme for me through my life. And when Rick invited me into the conversation about faith, work, and economics, it felt to me like it was something that either I'd been waiting for or it had been waiting for me for a long time. It just took a long time to come to fruition. So um, Obviously, I have a perspective on this, um, and what I want to try to do today is to give you a, a, a way of thinking about the relationship between these things. And, um, and I'm going to start with what I see as a, a condition that we live in more and more in our world, which is what I would call the condition of fragmentation. And what I mean by fragmentation is a situation where uh, we're operating in multiple communities, multiple environments all the time, and these things are pulling us apart all the time. So when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in suburban Chicago, but uh, the community, the suburb that I was in was a, was a working class community, it was a blue collar community. It was not, uh, certainly was not religiously <clears throat> homogeneous, but it was not even really culturally homogeneous. And so it was pretty diverse in some ways, but there were sort of assumed standards and ethics of what was right and what was wrong and what was okay and what wasn't. And as I often say, I, I knew that if I was doing something that was gonna get my ears boxed at home, it was also gonna get my ears boxed at Bobby Schmidt's house or at Stash Lizodiak's house or you know whoever's house, or Debbie Blick's house, whoever it was, because there was an idea of what was right and what was wrong that we shared, regardless of our particular religious affiliation, religious community. And, uh, and so it was kind of a, ethically speaking, it was a kind of a, 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 a homogeneous culture. That situation to hardly exist anymore people really find that difficult to find. There's no standards of, there's no common sense of how kids are supposed to behave in church. There's no common sense of how people are supposed to behave in church. So people people come to church and behave the same way they do at a Cubs game. You know, if they want to get up in the middle and go for refreshments or carry on a conversation, who cares, you know, whatever. And and when you, when you first see that, it's like, is this okay or isn't this okay? I mean, this certainly wasn't okay when I, so there's a lot of disorientation. And 
Um, so when we're living in a single culture or community environment, that uh, it allows us to live as whole people in relationship with other people that we share things with in terms of standards that we might not ever talk about, we might not ever say, it's just understood. It just isn't done, or it is done. Um, in the situation that we're in now, when we're living in simultaneously in multiple value systems, it leaves many of us feeling disoriented and anxious, schizoid, even violent in some cases, trying to figure out how to make this fit for us. And I think that it leaves us in a state where many of us feel disintegrated. Who are you when you're at home with your family as compared to who you are when you're at work, as compared to who you are when you're at church, as compared to who you are? And they're all you, but they're really different. You behave not quite the same when you're at work as you do when you're with your brothers and sisters. And that sense of, of disintegration becomes something that uh, in us we look to kind of put back together into a whole person, and that's a big part of what it means to live life well. So that brings us to our fundamental questions. And I think that it is safe to say um, that when I was a kid, and uh, certainly this has been historically true for the Lutheran Church, that the main function of religious life was to deal with the question of how do I build a right relationship with other parts of my life, the business community, the neighborhood, the political, all that stuff kind of was done by other people. The church had a niche, and the church's role was to work on this, specifically this relationship with God. And we did that through traditional spiritual practices, worship, traditional structures, and rhythms of communal life. Um, everybody knew what a church community or a, a committee was. Um, on Thursday nights, if you lived in particularly in a small town, on Thursday nights, everybody was a choir practice. Some people were at the Presbyterian Church choir practice, and some people were at the Methodist Church choir practice, and so, but that's what people did on Thursday nights, right? So, uh, so the, the church dealt specifically with that. Now, in this more fragmented society, what I find, and we have lots of research, by the way, that backs this up, just studies of people's attitudes and so forth that we've done. The question is, what does it mean to live life well? So just won't go into this in great deep depth, but what does it mean to you to live life well? What are what are some of the components that go into living life well? Having friends. Having friends. Okay, good. Friendship. Peace of mind. Being, being peaceful. Yeah. Being peaceful. Peace okay. of mind. Peace of mind. Having a warm climate. Having a family, <laughs> being in a warm climate, getting to play golf every morning before breakfast, you know, whatever. Um, and I think for lots of people, because of the way our culture portrays itself to us over and over again, and it, prosperity, work, success, abundance are for many, many people part, not all but a part of what it means to live life well. Look at commercials. You know, I, I, if you look, regardless of what it's advertising, regardless of what it is, regardless of who lives there, if you actually look at the homes that are portrayed in commercials, there's no way that you could live in a home like that with less than $125,000 a year of income. That's all subliminal. It goes into our minds as this is what it means to live life well, to be able to have a house like this. So that pulls us in the direction, two directions. First of all, it pulls us in the direction in the church of having to be more focused on the intentional integration of faith and the rest of life. We cannot assume that somebody else is doing that. We cannot assume that we can just do the God part and the people will figure out all the rest. We have to be much more explicit about this. And the other thing is that I think in order to do this now in our society, we have to be talking about the relationship between faith, work, and economics and what that means. So this is uh, what has led me into great interest in the work that um, Rick has been involved with in this relationship. And as I've worked it through, um, I've kind of put together a model 
uh, the interaction of these things, um, which I like to do. I'm a visual person, and so models work for me. So um, this is kind of the picture that I've come up with, and I apologize. I gave this idea to a graphic artist, and they did a lovely job, except that it doesn't project very well because the letters are too light. <laughs> but what you've got in this very Trinitarian, very Lutheran scheme is three circles, faith, work, and economics. And I think that it's the integration of these things. It's not as though faith, work, and economics are bubbles floating around out there in space, and there's some kind of a relationship between them, but we don't know exactly what it is. I think they're inseparably linked in, in a model. And that what comes out of living more fully into the integration of that model and those three elements is that work starts to take on more and more the picture of vocation. That is a call from God to be, to be someone, to do something, and to go somewhere. And uh, vocation in Lutheran tradition is a very important theme, as I'm sure many of you know and you've talked about before if you've been in these classes. It, Lutherans have a very distinctive angle on this. When Luther wrote about the, the idea of vocation, he was writing into a social context where vocation was specifically applied to the religious. The vocation, a vocation was to be a nun or a monk or a priest. Those were the people with vocations. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was just a poor working slob. Luther sanctified the word vocation by saying, no, vocation is not about God calling you out of the world and into the cloister. God is about pouring you back out into the world as a person of faith. So everything you do out there in the world is vocation, at least potentially vocation. Wonderful stories, but I'll just tell this one because it's one of my favorites. Uh, when I was on internship, I met a man doing pastoral care stuff. I was going around to meet different people in the church, and I talked, met this man, and visited him in his home. He was an HVAC guy, did heating and air conditioning. Right? And so we were sitting there having a conversation, and he started to just spin His eyes lit up. It was amazing. He was so excited to talk to me about this. He started to tell me stories about all the times that he'd gotten calls at 2 o'clock in the morning, and some poor mother furnace went out, and, and she, she was afraid her kids were going to get sick because they were cold and he would get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go fix her furnace in the middle of the night. This is a vocation, right? He was not just an HVAC guy. He was a man with a mission. And that mission was in a very important way to love and serve your neighbor, which is the other piece of vocation for Luther, is that all of our vocations in whatever arena of our life, whether it's the home, whether it's political life, whether it's business, <clears throat> whether it's politics, whatever, government, the, the vocation is somehow oriented for a purpose of loving and serving the neighbor. But in this model, of course, because it's an integrated model, there are also dyads. So there's an overlapping circle between faith and work. There's an overlapping in the circles between work and economics, and there's an overlapping in the circles between economics and faith, again, on the other side. So what goes in those spaces? And I would say that in the space between faith and work, we get morality. <clears throat> I'll be able to go into this a little more tomorrow when we have more time, but I'll just kind of give you a shorthand. Morality for me is a very distinctive thing. It's about my internalized sense of right and wrong. What do I believe in my heart of hearts is right and wrong? And how we live in relationship to what we believe. So if I am living a life that is consonant with what I believe is the way I should live my life, what I experience is that I am a moral person. If I am living a life that is in conflict with what I believe is right and wrong, then for me, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, for me, I'm living an immoral life. And that is a problem for me that disintegrates me. I can't just compartmentalize and say, I'm okay here and I'm not okay. I'm, I'm me, wherever I am. The third option is amorality, which is that you have no internalized sense of right and wrong, and that actually is a psychopathology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, so uh, morality becomes the way it is, becomes connected to work in this sense that work is also an externalization of what we believe. It's an externalization of who we are. It's who we are out there in the world. And so how we work, the way we work, where we work, all of those things have a moral component to them that can either make us feel better about our life or worse about our life. And that becomes part of the integration challenge. Between work and economics, work in this sense, the way I'm using it, is an individual thing. It's the way I, as a moral actor, work in the world and accomplish things. And I'll spend more time on different ways to think about work. But work with others is the way we coordinate in order to make an economy. So when my work is integrated with your work, is integrated with your work, is integrated with your work, we come up with something that looks like an economy. And in order to make that work, we need something that is broadly called governance. Now, I'm not talking about government, because I'm guessing that there are lots of attitudes here about government. But in my sense of the word governance, what I'm saying is a rule book. You cannot play a good game of soccer if some of the people are playing baseball rules, and some of the people are playing basketball rules, and some of the people are playing American football rules, right? You have to have a stipulated set of principles or ideas or whatever that you're going to hold yourself accountable to in order to be in the game. And if you do not have at some form of governance, it can be light, it can be heavy, it can come from here, it can come from there, but if there isn't some sort of rule book that the people in the game agree to, you get something that is very, it's not just competitive, it's chaotic. It, it becomes quickly so adversarial that it's very difficult to organize it into an economy. So uh, we have to have some kind of governance structure. The structure that stands between economics and faith in my model is what I would call social ethics. Now in some circles, particularly in the ELCA, this would be called justice. I tend to stay away from, I don't mind conversation about justice, but I have a problem sort of uh, standardizing it because I don't think that there's a standard understanding of what justice is. Justice is one, I, I had a synod justice committee when I first started as bishop, big room full of people, there were like 20 people here, and I started out my meeting with them, I said I would like everybody on a sheet of paper in one or two sentences to give me a definition of justice. And I had 22 definitions. Right? Some people think everybody gets what they deserve. Some people what, what they get what they earn. Some people think justice is everybody gets the same. Somebody thinks that justice is about uh, the redistribution of power. Some people think it's about the redistribution of material wealth. Some people think justice is, I mean, does justice mean we all start in the same place but end where we end? Does it mean that everybody ends with the same number of toys at the end of the day? And what a lawyer means by justice is really, I know, there are probably some lawyers in here too, what, what the law, I'll put it this way, what the law means by justice is not the same as what the prophet Amos means by justice. So justice is not a very helpful word to me, even though it's, it's common, we have to spend more time with it. But social ethics, this gets into the relationship between morality and ethics. And for me, even though those words are often used interchangeably, I think there's an important distinction between them. Morality is how am I behaving with respect to what I understand to be right and wrong. Ethics is how I'm behaving with respect to how my community defines right and wrong. It's a social concept. So what that means, what that allows for the possibility of being moral, but unethical. That's what a whistleblower is. A whistleblower is someone who operates out of their own sense of right and wrong, and therefore they're behaving morally, but they're behaving in a way that's way out of line with the ethics of the community that they're blowing the whistle. They're seen as disloyal, as disruptive, as troublemakers, as blah, 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 blah. Why? Because they've stepped outside of the ethical framework of the community that they're blowing the whistle. 
by the same token, it's possible for a person to simply put up and shut up and conform with the ethics of the community that they're in, but be immoral. Because even though externally they're just following the rules, mm -hmm. I'm just following orders, inside they know it's wrong and they're doing it anyway. So they're being completely ethical and completely immoral at the same time. I think that social ethics is actually the place where this model, I mean, it's, it breaks down in lots of places in here, but I think this is the place where it's really noticeable, where the model is breaking down in our social experience. Why? Because social ethics take our, applied to our economic life, call our economy to account to the principles and values of a faith perspective doesn't have to be a Christian faith perspective or a Jewish faith perspective, but there's some, when I say it's a faith perspective, it's faith in something beyond yourself. It's faith in something beyond your own ego. It's faith in something beyond, frankly, your own self-interest. And that, that faith in something beyond is what this calls us, makes us accountable to. And we can't find it because of the fragmentation. We can't find that 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 we're going to hold ourselves accountable to. And that becomes a problem now for the whole system because when the economy is not accountable to anything, then it starts to go off the rails in terms of what? In terms of this question, the outside circle. Because where it tends to go off the rails is that we can we can be we can be prosperous, we can be abundant, we can be, but if we're not somehow holding ourselves and each other accountable, then it's not it's not a vocation in the sense of loving and serving our neighbor. Because we're not putting anything back into the community in order to make a good community for everybody who works in it. I think, personally, I believe that the church is, or religious communities, um, because it really does go beyond the church. And I spent two years as president of the Council of Religious Leaders in Metropolitan Chicago, which is a wonderful experience. I, mean, I actually was, Cardinal Supic actually invited me to preach at Holy Name Cathedral on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. That doesn't happen to every Lutheran. <laughs> In fact, if anybody had told me, I said this in my sermon, I said, if anybody had told me that on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, I was going to be here, <laughs> that probably would not have come from the most. The Council of Religious Leaders is an A to Z table. It goes from Anglicans to Zoroastrians and everything in between. And what you find when you work in a broadly interfaith environment like that <coughs> is that there are faith values that are not specific to one particular ideology, <coughs> one, one specific theological perspective, that actually are a com. There is still there some commonality about decency about right and wrong, about civil discourse. I mean, that's really what you're doing with the civil discourse, the five principles of civil discourse, right? Seven. Seven, seven. seven. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're, you're setting up a, a, a boundary of governance mm -hmm. uh, on the operation of this particular community. And I think that one of the things that, uh, that we can think about with all this, and then I'll sort of end here because we're gonna go into much more depth on these things for those of you who can make it tomorrow, I hope some of you will. Um, there, there is a, a really an important way in which I think that the church, churches, congregations can start to imagine themselves. We talk about congregations as communities, and that's true. I think we can start to talk about congregations as economies. And what does it look like? How does it change your frame of mind if you start to think about your congregation as a local economy in terms of the faith values, in terms of how people are finding access to work within the community and beyond the community? What, are the, what, what is the economy that you create here and what are you gonna hold that economy accountable to? 
And what happens is that for the people who participate years after year in the life of an economy like this one, it forms you. And it becomes part of your morality that you're taking out into the world. So it starts out as a social ethic, like the seven principles. That gets internalized. That's why it's important to repeat them every week, right? Because you're internalizing them. Now when you see those seven principles, for those of you that have been here for weeks and weeks or months and months or years and years, it's like, oh yeah, that stuff. <laughs> it's self-evident because you've internalized it. Now it's not just an ethic that you agree on, it's the morality of the people who are in here. And you are gonna take that morality as your center and you're gonna carry it out into the world and it's gonna have an impact on all the different arenas of work that you engage in, employment, friendships, neighborhoods, political life, all of that, family, <clears throat> all of that becomes true. So, I think we'll stop it there. Mm, interesting. Mm. Uh, th thank you, <laughs> this, uh, you know, it's like a lot of gifts for the world. <laughs> let you go and again I hope you can join us tomorrow but speak to one of either two things yeah what if I'm sitting here I go well I'm retired none of this applies to me no, me too <laughs> <laughs> so how do you apply this to yourself now having just gone through that you know that one or I was taught the economy is driven by me following my own self-interest right right and if I follow my own self-interest Somehow that all gets worked out in the wash. Right. So, so I actually, I, this probably reassure some of you, I am a capitalist. <laughs> I believe in capitalism. Um, but, and the self-interest piece is a huge part of it. But I think that for me, uh, it, it, to work it, at its best, I think it requires us to work in short-term and long-term frames. So, so what is my, if, if I'm, hungry and I'm going to be hungry for the next two weeks and I've got 12 sandwiches in the refrigerator right my self-interest on one level is to eat until I'm full my self-interest in the long term is eat one sandwich every day and you'll be better at the end of two weeks right? so it does require i think to make this work i think it requires i also think that it requires seeing self-interest if this, this again this may be controversial and we may need to talk more about this i i think it also requires us to be able to step up and, and to break through the illusion of self-sufficiency no one is self-sufficient no one. some people are more independent some people are more autonomous. Some people have the, the luxury of being able to make more choices between this and that for their life, all of that. But there's no one, if you're working in an economy, there's no one who is truly self-sufficient. I mean, this is, this. when I was a buyer for National Can, you better believe that even though I was, I was competing and transacting with my suppliers, I needed them. And I protected my suppliers from the people on my team because it was our self-interest to pay attention to their self-interest. So I, so I do think that that's part of it. And then just briefly on the question of retirement, I think that the other thing that, uh, I mentioned this in passing, but I think it's really important to emphasize it. Vocation is not just in the realm of commerce. Vocation happens in multiple arenas simultaneously. I have a vocation now, since I have left my vocation as a synod bishop, I have been drawn much more deeply into my vocation as a husband and a father. Not that I wasn't before, but I've got focus now. My vocation is a son. My mother is 95 years old. She lives in the nursing home. I spend a lot of time with my mom now that I didn't have time to spend with her when I was working. As a bishop, particularly, I was all over the place. So there are constantly through our lives, our vocation is not one thing. Vocation is a function of time and timing as much as anything else. 
And, and I think that to honor that, to listen to it, to make sure that, and part of the way we listen to it is in community. When we have conversations in community, you hear yourself say things, you hear other people say things, you say, huh, never thought about that before. My understanding of work, for example, which I'll get into tomorrow, has really opened because of something you said when I was making a presentation up at the, at the LECNA leadership thing. You said something about work that was outside of the frame of what I was thinking, how I was thinking about work and changed my whole way of thinking about what work is and what it isn't. So, uh, so the community interaction is also a big part of how Let's thank you again. Uh, <laughs>